Hey, Evan, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Okay. So you've written extensively about the freedom of expression, digital censorship, and the like on the internet. Elon Musk purchased Twitter, claiming to be a free speech absolutist. But of course, his actions in the last several weeks, uh, as we've been discussing, are starkly inconsistent with those claims. So why don't we start there? Where do you think that inconsistency between his claims and his actions actually come from? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, if we're going to have an honest conversation about this, we have to start with recognizing that it's not just Elon Musk who exhibits this hypocrisy, right? Many of the folks that are screaming the loudest about free speech in U.S. Congress and, uh, you know, in kind of the punditry in the U.S. are also folks that are actively trying to criminalize speech about abortion, who are actively passing laws in the states that criminalize uh, online sharing of content about gender affirming care for trans folks. So there's definitely, you know, a broad kind of swath of hypocrisy around this issue where, um, you know, folks are not so much committed to the principles of free speech, but really they're working the refs. And I think that's the way to look at this is that a lot of these debates about content moderation are not actually about principles, but very much about um, how do I get my side to win? How do I make sure that my side's voices are heard and censor the voices of the other side? And frankly, that's not limited to just the far right. That's a problem that I think has cut across the political spectrum. And for those of us that have been working on issues around free expression and tech accountability and content moderation for years, it can be very frustrating to see what's actually a, a really difficult problem to solve in terms of what types of policies actually actually do lead to the most number of people having the most ability to express themselves. That's a very different question than, you know, what Musk, I think, thought he was doing when he bought Twitter, which is, well, let's just get rid of all the rules and then we'll have more speech. That's not actually how it works in practice. And I think he his speed run of free speech absolutism has come to a, a kind of <laughs> spectacular crash here, um, which I know we'll get into in a minute. Yeah, I mean, I want to echo your point about this Elon Musk being a kind of singular, toxic, cartoonish, caricatured version of a larger phenomenon and problem. I mean, the kind of censorship or shadow banning that I am most concerned with, frankly, is less the very explicit, I'm banning a journalist and everybody can see me being a complete asshole right out in front. Like that that's the kind of censorship that at least people can see. I worry a lot about the algorithm as an example. What does the algorithm prioritize, not prioritize? How does that actually uh, really control uh, the so-called discourse in the world? And, and, and I just want to ask you, I mean, I'm concerned. I've been concerned with with the algorithm, uh, and I use that as a stand-in for all these different subtle ways that the conversation, uh, that the discourse, that information is manipulated. H how, knowing that that is operating in so many different ways, uh, what can be done about that? And why are why are we rarely ever talking about that? Why why are we always running towards the shiny or grotesque thing uh, like Elon Musk? Yeah, for sure. And I think this is exactly what we need to be talking about because it's what actually points us toward real solutions. Um, it's really, really difficult to regulate speech. It comes with tremendous trade-offs and consequences. That's why we have the First Amendment. That's why so many people kind of have this core value around free expression. But where we can have a meaningful intervention here is around the surveillance. The thing that makes Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram uniquely different from even like Fox News or the kind of propaganda networks of the past is not the speech. It's not the number of people speaking. It's the surveillance. It's the ability to collect people's data and use that to power algorithmic recommendations to kind of shove information directly into the minds of the people who are most susceptible to it. And also to kind of just like amplify and suppress content not based on the value of that content but just based on how clicky it is right and so and and we have so little transparency into how those kind of black box algorithms work and there's been unfortunately i think 
Also, now, you know, finally, some folks have started talking about the algorithm, but then there's this idea of like, well, let's just ban algorithms. And like, <laughs> that's, you know, also a fool's errand. Um, and in the United States, um, like it or not, most algorithmic recommendation systems are likely protected by the First Amendment. Platforms, again, like it or not, kind of have a First Amendment right to pick and choose what content they amplify and what content they suppress. And so, again, it's really difficult to regulate the speech that comes out, but you can regulate the surveillance that goes in. And by cutting off the stream of data that platforms kind of vacuum up and use to manipulate public information, we can have a positive intervention that reduces some of the harm that we see coming from kind of big tech monopolies and their business practices without the kind of huge collateral damage to human rights and particularly to marginalized people that we see when governments attempt to dictate the speech rules on these platforms. That's a fascinating point because, of course, the algorithms are fueled by the data. The algorithms respond to the data you're talking about. For instance, I mean, just a rudimentary example, who's clicking on what? what in what geography is what the algorithm needs to know in order to serve uh, that geography and those users more of that content or certain kinds of content. Now, I want to go back to Musk for a second. You wrote a piece for Time magazine in early November in which you wrote, quote, it's fair to say that Elon purchased Twitter because he believes social media platforms are too heavy handed and arbitrary in how they apply their content moderation and speech policies. And you write, I actually agree with him about that. Tell us a little, a little bit of detail about what specific aspects you agreed with him uh, on when you wrote that. Yeah, for sure. And this is something too where it's incredibly frustrating to me that we've actually allowed kind of right wing trolls like Elon Musk to claim this mantle around free speech and around um, kind of um, content moderation being applied in an unfair manner. Because the reality is that we actually have data to tell us what kind of is going on with content moderation globally. And what we know is that conservatives are not the most censored people on social media. The most censored people on social media are predominantly Arab and Muslim folks who live outside the U.S., whose speech is routinely caught up in automated anti-terrorism filters that are basically labeling everyday religious speech, like perhaps a quote from the Quran or speech about local politics as terrorism and automatically removing it before a human moderator has even looked at it. The, the other group that we know has been effective chased off of almost every major platform is sex workers and adult content creators. And so I think it's really important because what I see when folks like Musk start saying, oh, we're going to unban all the accounts, even folks on the left seem to assume like, oh, most of those accounts are probably right wing jerks. When in the reality is a huge number of those accounts could be Palestinian activists, sex workers, folks that have been doing uh, work around racial justice who've had their accounts unfairly locked or banned. Um, but we're almost accepting the right wing narrative that conservatives and, you know, uh, powerful white men are somehow the most oppressed people on social media when that's just not the case. And so I think it's really important that we um, don't see that ground and that we recognize that actually um, when content moderation rules are applied at scale arbitrarily by large for profit corporations that do not have a racial justice analysis or a gender justice analysis, um, they are making arbitrary decisions all the time that disproportionately impact marginalized people. And we need to kind of take that into account. That doesn't mean that we just throw up our hands and say, well, there should be no content moderation, but it means that we need to be real about the trade-offs. And we need to recognize that when we demand that platforms remove more content more quickly, or when we say broad things like, I want platforms to remove all violent content, quote unquote, we need to think about what that actually means and what the end result of that is, because platforms are going to be making judgment calls. And what we know is that that often backfires Fires on activist social movements that I think many on the left or many progressives or many who care about human rights would not want to be silenced and censored. And so we need to be real about those trade-offs. You can believe that it's worth it. You know, there's so much right-wing organizing and violence on social media, we should shut it down. But you need to acknowledge that doing so will come with collateral damage to the social movements that you care about. And you can believe that trade-off is worth it, but we need to be real about the fact that there is a trade-off there. What bothers me is when people want to pretend that there's just some magical lever we can pull that will censor all the bad stuff and leave up all the good stuff. That lever doesn't exist. And so we need to have a more real conversation.
conversation about what content moderation looks like and what practices we can put in place. Again, not to ensure uh, maximum speech for everyone, but how do we ensure the most number of people have the most freedom to speak? Those are two very different questions and come with different answers. Now, some of the the pushback that you've seen from uh, Elon Musk's fans are kind of a, a, an equivalency. Uh, it's sort of this idea that, well, look, uh, Jeff Bezos um, bought the Washington Post. Rupert Murdoch runs Fox News. One question I would ask for you is, how do you see Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter as significantly different from and more dangerous than a the head of Amazon uh, buying one of the most influential newspapers in the country, the newspaper of the capital city, or Rupert Murdoch running a giant media empire. Now, to be clear, I think we can stipulate none of these phenomena are good. They're all dangerous, like oligarchs controlling the entire information uh, ecosystem that we live inside of is not good. The greatest movie ever made, Citizen Kane, tried to warn us about this many, 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 many decades ago. The network tried to warn us about it again. So just stipulating that none of it is good. What do you see as a, as the fundamental difference, if, if any, uh, between the kind of Bezos, Murdoch, traditional media empire play and Elon Musk buying a social media platform? Yeah, in a lot of ways, I see them as as kind of all part of the same web, right? This is about powerful people and elites who have always had a vested interest in controlling discourse and can shaping narratives. And so I see them as kind of all related. That said, I think there are core differences. You know, there is no black Twitter on Fox News, right? There is no, uh, you know, massive community of uh, LGBTQ young people who are using uh, the Washington Post as like a place where they hang out and organize, right? And so there are concrete differences between a kind of centralized, uh, you know, newspaper, magazine, TV network, and a social media network network that has been, for better or for worse, a kind of a home. I saw someone tweet, you know, this hasn't just been a hell site, it's been a hell home. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's true. You know, it's we have built our, our digital homes and offices and businesses on land that we don't own. Um, and we're really kind of starting to recognize the um, uh, you know, just how uh, tenuous that is, I think, for um, the media ecosystem, for activists, for artists and creators. Um, and, you know, so and I think for Musk, this is very much about um, the culture war. He's made that pretty clear. Right. It's about vengeance politics um, and it's about this sense of, uh, you know, well, we're going to go get the other side. Um, and, you know, those kind of ideas are just sort of antithetical to the type of demeanor that one needs to run um, a social media website that actually works. Um, and I think, you know, in some like I probably wouldn't be very good at running a social media website either. I'm too opinionated. Right. And I think it is um, it's a real challenge and it, cre- it c- requires a tremendous amount of deliberation, um, you know, which is why I think in the end, this is also why um, Twitter and things like it, um, I hope, are not the future of social media, um, because in the end, whether it's controlled by a benevolent billionaire or or, a, you know, an evil billionaire or even a benevolent kind of big nonprofit bureaucracy or something like that. As long as we're building our digital infrastructure on kind of land that we don't own, it's not going to be sustainable and it's always going to be susceptible to censorship, surveillance uh, and other types of human rights crackdowns. So let's move towards a, a future or envisioning a future, because we've just, I think, articulated what the problem is. Uh, I think a lot of people understand uh, inherently the problem with uh, billionaires controlling uh, the content creation machine and now billionaires obviously controlling the platforms upon which uh, content is distributed. Twitter as a platform, the Washington Post as a content uh, creation machine. So then the question is, okay, what can be done? Some people talk about, you know, quote, nationalizing Twitter. Uh, I don't exactly know what that means. Um, there's talk about um, uh, regulation. I know Europe has done some regulation when it comes to uh, comes to content neutrality uh, and the like. So practically speaking, 
in the name of protecting uh, free speech, uh, access to speech by the most number of people, but also understanding that content moderation is necessary uh, and not having it be in the hands of, you know, one uh, all powerful Dr. Evil style billionaire. What are some practical things policy wise that could be put in place? I think the biggest one is around competition. Um, and we've had um, several antitrust bills here in the United States that attempt to crack down on some of the anti-competitive practices that big tech companies have engaged in for years that are part of why we don't have a sort of immediate, obvious, you know, everyone's sort of scrambling and saying, like, are you going to Mastodon? Or are you going to post? Or like, where are you going? There isn't just like an obvious place to go. And part of that is because the largest tech companies have for years engaged in practices that actively make it hard for you to leave, that they often will buy up or copy uh, startups or new companies that come along to kill them off before they gain network effect. Um, and so that is one of the places where we can actually have a regulatory intervention to crack down on some of those anti-competitive practices. And that's not going to magically suddenly fix everything that's wrong with the internet, but it can help set us on a path where, you know, a few years from now, we could have something like Mastodon or something like Matrix or something like Blue Sky that actually takes off and and could become an actual meaningful Twitter replacement where kind of, you know, we can have, uh, you know, it, the actual type of digital public square that Musk claimed he was, you know, going to build by buying this platform. Um, and but and I think, can I just can I just yeah, add yeah. when I hear people saying, well, yeah, I might go to Mastodon. I might go to this social media site, that one. And there isn't one Twitter replacement. Maybe that's part of the solution. Maybe there shouldn't be just one. Right. No, absolutely. I completely agree. And this is why I think, again, you know, so there's the policy of, you know, antitrust cracking down on anti-competitive practices, data privacy legislation to cut down on kind of the the exponential um, kind of monopoly abuse of once you get big enough and you have all the data, it's really, really hard to compete with that. So that's on the policy side. On the actual tech side, I think, you know, it's also important that we look at, um, you know, how do we create communities that can be insular, but also interoperate, right? And this is, you know, in some ways, um, you know, what Mastodon is or that the Fediverse is, is you can create your own Mastodon server. Think of it like email. You can set up an email account on, you know, Gmail, if that's the most popular thing, or on ProtonMail, which is more privacy protective. But either way, you can email your friends and they can email you and you can kind of find each other. And, you know, so we could have social media that's more like that. But I think you're right, too. It's like since Twitter has gotten, you know, more of a dumpster fire than it used to be. I'm in more signal chats with just like, you know, a group of 25 people who have something specific to talk about. And like, yeah, maybe not every single one of our thoughts needs to be posted onto like the main feed for all perpetuity. Um, and in some ways, I, I hope, you know, my, my optimistic hope um, coming out of all of this is that it at least creates enough of a rupture in what has, you know, sort of until recently been a somewhat stagnant or calcified conversation around big tech power and content moderation and speech um, that maybe just like shakes things up a little bit and does get us to, to think about, you know, what do we actually want? You know, how do we actually want the Internet to function? Um, what kinds of communities online and spaces online do we need? Which ones already exist? Which ones need to be built? Which ones need to be improved? What policies need to be changed to enable them? Um, you know, these are the foundational conversations that we need to be having. And I think in order to have them, we sort of need to move past this like cyclical back and forth of like, no, you're censoring us. No, you're censoring us. Like we need to get past that and actually build infrastructure that functions for public discussion, for social movements, for artists and activists, et cetera. Now, you mentioned antitrust, and there's something happening uh, right now. Right now, there are two bipartisan antitrust bills languishing in Congress aimed at limiting the power of some of these huge tech companies. Uh, there's the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, which would bar tech platforms from giving preferential treatment to their own products. There's also the Open App Markets Act, which would prevent companies that operate digital app stores from restricting which developers can sell their products. Now, as we record this interview on Monday, we're waiting to see if Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer will bring these bills to the Senate floor for a vote. Though we've reported at the lever that Chuck Schumer has very deep ties to the tech industry. Uh, so in a sense, it's not a surprise that this is the particular guy who's been stalling the legislation. Even if these bills are passed, 
which again, right now, as of the moment that we're talking, it's a big if. How much would they actually do to address the issues that we're now seeing at Twitter or at least across uh, the, the technology landscape that we're talking about? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, just to, to put an even finer point on it, basically at this point, if these bills either go into the omnibus spending package that's expected to come out any minute now, or, or they're probably done for the year. And as you said, if they are done for the year, this is absolutely, uh, kind of, we need to lay this at the feet of Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. He's already kind of trying to blame it on McConnell. I'm sure he'll try to, you know, say, oh, the votes just weren't there. That's bunk. Um, these bills, every, it has been an open secret in Washington, D.C. that these bills had enough bipartisan support that if he had put them on the floor at any time over the last number of months, they would have passed overwhelmingly. Nobody wants to go on the record, uh, you know, voting against the bills on behalf of their friend Mark Zuckerberg. Like, that's not how politics works in Washington, D.C. But we are here now because the tech companies spent more than $100 million lobbying against these bills. Um, and that tells you something about how scared the tech companies were of these bills. And that tells you something about the fact that these bills actually are quite strong. You know, we at Fight for the Future spend a lot of time opposing bad legislation that would make things worse in the name of making things better. For once, these were actually two good bills that would move the ball forward. And again, they're not going to magically solve everything that's wrong. But by cracking down on some of those anti-competitive practices, you start to create more of a level playing field for developers, for software developers, for uh, alternatives that are coming along and you start to kind of chip away at the calcification that again, you know, it's not an overnight fix, but it's a structural change that kind of puts us on a path toward a future more like the one we were just talking about where people have meaningful choices to go online and find spaces with content moderation rules and privacy practices that work for them and their community. Um, and, you know, that sounds like a bit of a fairy tale right now, but it could be within reach, but it is going to take regulatory interventions. It's not going to happen all by itself um, as much as, you know, <laughs> the folks might want it to. It is going to require, you know, this is the problem with monopoly. Monopolies, uh, you know, are self-reinforcing and they require interventions to break. Evan Greer is an activist, organizer, and director of the digital rights advocacy group Fight for the Future. You can find Evan on Twitter at Evan underscore Greer for as long as that account exists and for as long as Twitter exists. Evan, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, David. Great to be on.